This week is a double Parsha. As you may recall, this year, past couple of weeks, we've been off schedule with our brethren in the land of Israel because we have two days of Shavuos and they had only one. So the last couple of weeks, uh, they've been a week ahead of us. Now this week in the diaspora, we have two Parshios, Chukas and Balak. And in Israel, they just have Balak. So we're going to be aligned and synchronized with our brethren in Israel. Now, as it happens to be, two years ago, 5781, Parshas Chukas and Parshas Balak were separated. So I have a little dilemma, a little problem. As you know, this year on the Parsha podcast, the seventh year of the Parsha podcast, we have been rebroadcasting not just the rebroadcast that covers the whole Parsha in about an hour, but also the episode from two years ago from 5783. Well, 5783, there are two that can match our Parsha. There's Parsha's Chukas and Balak. So I made an executive decision after some consultation with uh, no one, <laughs> myself. This was done all here, in-house, Torch Center, just me. I decided to actually release both of them individually. So what we're going to do is we're going to release uh, the Parshas Chukas one. So this one, Parshas Chukas, and then tomorrow we're going to release the episode for Parshas Balak from two years ago. You have an extra podcast to enjoy I uh, hope it, uh, it does not overwhelm you at the amount of uh, podcast listening that you may need to do this week to listen to everything that we have on the Parsha Podcast. But I hope you enjoy it regardless. And as always, send me an email, rabbiwolby at gmail.com. In our Parsha, we have, of course, the mitzvah of the red cow, the red heifer. Now, it's interesting that the entire body of Torah, since the Exodus, until this juncture of the Torah essentially takes up about a year and a half of time. And in our Parsha, there is a 38-year jump. There's 38 years of the 40-year experience from the Exodus until the end of the Torah that we really don't know anything about what happened in that time. We do know a little bit. We know, for example, some of the destinations, some of the junctures, some of the stations that the Jewish people encamped at. But truthfully... The entire body of Torah, the corpus of Torah, the mitzvahs of the Torah, the narratives of the Torah, the drama of the stories, all that happened either the first year and a half or so and the last several months. And our Parsha has the big jump from chapter 19 to chapter 20. Chapter 19 is the final mitzvah that we're told about that happens before the jump. And we open up chapter 20 with the death of Miriam, and that is 38 years later. And this mitzvah, the red cow, the red heifer, is the very last instruction that was conveyed before this 38-year fast forward. And of course, it's a very strange and completely baffling procedure to purify someone who has come into contact with a dead body. You have to take a completely red cow. And the truth is, it's actually burnt orange. We have red cows, like the Texas Longhorn, for example. It's burnt orange. But this is a specific kind of red cow. It's unblemished. doesn't have white hairs or black hairs. It never had a yoke on it. And you slaughter it outside the camp. It's slaughtered by a commoner, but it's overseen by the Kohen. And then you burn the cow. And into the fire, you throw a concoction of cedar wood and hyssop and crimson thread. And this creates the magical potion, the magical ashes for the purification of those who became impure. And these ashes are sprinkled together with some fresh water upon someone who was in contact with a dead person over the course of their seven-year purification process. And quite intriguingly, the person who sprinkles the ashes and really the people that are involved in every stage of this purification process, they themselves become impure until nightfall. So we read it, and it's totally mystifying. It makes no sense to us. We don't have really a way of understanding. And indeed, it is classified as a chok, as part of a class of mitzvos that are completely beyond human intellect. No matter how hard you try, 
you are just not endowed with the tools to understand it. And our sages tell us that there was only one human in history, Moses, who was able to understand it. He was endowed with this knowledge by God. He was gifted this knowledge by God. But even King Solomon, the wisest of all men, he tried. He extended his mind to the furthest place that any human mind has gone. And he too was unable to understand it. And I think this raises some very fundamental questions. You know, if we don't understand this mitzvah, and we cannot perform this mitzvah, and we don't have a red cow, what can we learn from this mitzvah? Is there anything for us to discover, to learn, to glean insight from this very strange mitzvah, the mitzvah of the red cow? Now, in previous years on the Parsha podcast, we have shared some ideas. And today, I want to share a very powerful idea based upon an incredible Midrash at the beginning of our Parsha. This Midrash is oriented around this incomprehensible chok, this notion that there are themes that do not make sense to us, and they're the product, the handiwork of God. And what we will discover is that although the mechanism of the red cow is a total mystery to us, we don't understand why it works, it's part of an observable phenomenon that exists in the red cow and elsewhere too. Meaning that although we don't understand why the red cow works, The fact that it does work and the fact that we see examples of the same kind of transformation in other areas could be very valuable information for us. So let's open up the Midrash. The Midrash begins by quoting a verse in Job in Scripture. And the verse says, this is Job 14.4, Mi yitain tahar mitameh. Who will extract, who can extract purity from impurity? Is it not God? Who is able to do this, to extract purity from impurity? That's only God. And he gives some examples. Abraham, the most pure of all men, came from Terach, the most impure of all men. And Chizkiah came from Achaz. And Josiah, king of Judah, came from Ammon. And Mordechai from Shimi, and the Israelites from their idolatrous antecedents. And Olam Abba, the supreme idyllic world to come, the spiritual world to come, from this world. Who did this, says the Midrash? Who commanded this? Who decreed this? Is it not the one and only God? There is something that's so inexplicable to us. To extract holiness out of impurity, that's only the handiwork of God. Again, how it works, we can't understand. But to discover that such a phenomenon exists is a major discovery that can be quite transformational in our lives. And again, the Midrash finds this verse in Job to be the best explanation of the mystery of the red cow. How can purification come from this red cow? How can a person be cleansed from their impurity with a red cow? Now, we also know that red is associated with Asaph, Jacob's twin brother. It's associated with judgment. Kabbalistically, the cow is associated with judgment. It has no yoke. There's a certain refusal to submit to the higher authority of God. This is not the kind of animal that we would think will be the one to provide purification and cleansing. This is an animal that we would think is quite impure. Yet, who extracts purity from impurity? That's the handiwork of God. From this red comes purification. And again, the verse in Job spells it out. Who will extract purity from impurity? It's only the one God. This is something that only God can do. It doesn't make sense to us. And it gives us some examples. The great 
patriarch, Abraham, came from Terach. Terach, his father, was one of the worst humans in history. He was a purveyor of idolatry. He was a wholesaler of idols. And when Abraham, his son, rejected idolatry, Terach, his father, tried to have his own son, Abraham, burned alive in a furnace because he rejected idolatry. This is a barbaric beast we're talking about here. And who comes from Terach? Abraham, the pillar of the world, the most transformative person in human history, the person who changed the tide of civilization, the person who brought God into this world, the person who ended the era of darkness in the world. How does Abraham emerge from Terach? Typically, children inherit the qualities of their parents. It's a total mystery to us, as much as the red cow. Only God knows how that happens. Who can extract purity from impurity? Only God. And again, for us, we see this phenomenon again. From the darkest, most spiritually deficient source comes the brightest beacon of light. How did Abraham come from Terach? Only God can pull that off. How does purity come from a red cow? Only God can pull that off. And there's another point being implied here. Very deep idea. Only the red cow can provide this kind of purification. Nothing else will work. You can find the nicest, most peaceful, white dove, and you try to Do to it what you do to the red cow, and it doesn't work. It's almost like it had to be from this impure source where the purification came from. Similarly, we could surmise that Abraham could not have emerged from a regular nice Jewish family, gone to Jewish summer camps, and given a good, robust Jewish education. If he had that background, he would not have become Abraham. That's what is implied in this Midrash. It's only because his father was one of the worst people in the world and one of the worst idolaters in history that Abraham became Abraham. Abraham had to emerge from this dark abyss. He could not have come from any other place. Again, the Midrash brings a bunch of examples One of the examples is Olam Abba, the world to come. This idyllic and spiritual world emerges from this world, from this physical world, from this world where the spiritual is often ignored, from this world that is often cruel. The world to come, the spiritual world, can only emerge from this world. This is the big secret of the red heifer. The luscious tree with its luscious fruits cannot grow before the inedible seed is put into the inedible soil and it rots and it decomposes and you have this decomposing mush in the ground and only from that, only from that inglorious place can a tree emerge from. Does this make sense to us? Absolutely not. For us, it's a chok. Only God can pull these wonderful things out of such problematic origins. Now, I think if you look all over our Parsha, you find this theme everywhere. So we have this red cow, and from it comes purification. And then we have the death of Miriam. And from that, Rashi tells us, we get atonement. From a very dark place, a very sad place, a very unfortunate place, comes something very good. And then Moshe hits a rock, and it's a flinty stone. It's very dry. And what comes out of that? Water for the entire nation. And then there's snakes attacking people. 
And the way to solve it is to make a copper snake, and from the snake comes healing. So it's safe to say that this idea is a major theme of our Parsha. But in truth, it appears in many places in Jewish literature and Jewish philosophy. So for example, there's a very interesting Talmud in the book of Sanhedrin, page 96b, and found elsewhere in the Talmud, tells us that there were a bunch of villains of Jewish history who either themselves or their descendants actually became converts and became Jews and became close allies of our people. So it begins with Nevuzradin. Nevuzradin was the Babylonian general who destroyed Judah and Jerusalem. And the Talmud tells us that he butchered hundreds of thousands of innocent people when the temple was destroyed, the first temple that is. This is a monster. And yet the Talmud tells us that he became a genuine and sincere convert. Out of such inauspicious beginnings comes a Jew. And then it tells us about Sisra. Who was Sisra? Another monstrous, murderous villain of Jewish history. See the book of Judges. And it tells us, Sisra lamdu Torah The descendants of Sisra taught Torah in Jerusalem. Who are these descendants? So the commentaries tell us that this descendant being referenced is none other than the great Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva is the one who's chiefly responsible for the oral Torah that we have today. His students wrote the foundational works of the oral Torah. Could you imagine? The great titan, Rabbi Akiva, so instrumental for Jewish continuity, for Jewish Torah. And where does he come from? Where is his pedigree from? It comes from Sisra, a very evil villain of our history. And then there's Sancheriv. Sancheriv is the one who destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel and sent the ten lost tribes packing and tried to conquer Judah as well. Well, what happened to his descendants? The descendants of Sancheriv tells us the Talmud, they taught Torah publicly. And that's a reference to Shmaya and Aftalion, the teachers of Hillel and Shammai, the leaders of the Jewish people during the Second Temple era. And then Haman, of course, one of the worst villains of them all, the representative of Amalek, the one who tried to steam and destroy the entire Jewish people. Of course, we know his story from Purim. The descendants of Haman, they studied Torah and Bnei Brak. And then it tells us that there was one person who the Almighty really wanted to have their descendants come under the wings of the Shekhinah. And that's Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, of course, was the the emperor, the, the king of Babylon who destroyed the first temple. So the Almighty wanted to follow the same process and, so to speak, seduce or persuade his descendants to also become Jews and also study Torah. But the angel said to God, Master of the world, the one who destroyed your house, the temple, the one who burnt your sanctuary, you're going to bring him and his descendants underneath the wings of the Shekhinah? That's a bridge too far. So we see an amazing idea here, an amazing pattern. The Almighty is extracting purity from impurity from some of the most nefarious and evil and cruel and barbarous people of our history. And their descendants, the Almighty is extracting the holiness, the purity out of them. And even the worst of them all, Nebuchadnezzar, the Almighty would have done it if not for the angels intervening. Who does this? Who can extract holiness from such a poor origin? That is the handiwork of God. This idea also has messianic undertones. The Talmud tells us that Messiah will come in a generation that's entirely righteous or in a generation that's entirely wicked. 
meaning there is a version of the Messiah story that happens in a generation that's entirely wicked. Think about what that means, a generation that's entirely wicked. How do you extract holiness, redemption, transformation, renewal, renaissance? How do you have the messianic turnaround in a generation that's entirely wicked? This is the answer. The Almighty is able to extract holiness from very inauspicious places. Only the Almighty, who is able to sprout the world to come, the spiritual world, from this world, can bring redemption and Messiah from a world that has a lot of evil in it. And indeed, the evil in the world is fertile grounds for the sprouting of Messiah. Our sages tell us that the world will descend, or at least one version of how it could happen, the world will descend to the lowest level, and from there we'll have the redemption. It's exactly the opposite of what we would imagine. Moreover, the persona of Messiah himself, well, who are the antecedents of Messiah? The Messiah comes from a very checkered pedigree. Of course, you have Judah and Tamar, and ain't that a scandal? And they are the antecedents of Messiah. And you have Ruth and Boaz, and Ruth herself, where she comes from Lot and his daughters, and David and Bathsheba. This line, the Davidic line, the Messianic line, it has some very suspect and inglorious origins, and from that comes the light that will change the world forever. And that's the idea of the red cow. This is something that God does. It's a hope for us, but it's a very valuable thing to know that exists. There is a phenomenon where the purity can emerge from the impurity. And I think there's some very valuable takeaways for us from this idea. You know, we start with the big picture. It's hard for us not to look at the world and be quite pessimistic. The notion that the world will come back to God en masse seems increasingly less likely as time progresses. You know, religion in general has been on a pattern of secular decline, pardon the pun, for a long time. But this idea gives us comfort. Ironically, the further into the abyss humanity drifts, the more likely it is that they will experience a complete and unexpected turnaround. I think on a personal level, this is also true as well. There is this phenomenon that makes no sense to us, but it's featured everywhere we see. And I only brought some examples. There's many other examples that are found in Jewish literature and philosophy. Our purity and our holiness and our greatness comes from the least expected sources. And you can examine yourself. And if you were to be very honest with yourself, you know that you have major flaws. And I'll tell you a secret. That is the human condition. Congratulations. You are a human. You have flaws. And that may intimidate you. And that may cause you to want to give up. Oh, I'll never become the person that I want to become. I'll never achieve greatness. I'll never be exceptional. I'll always be average. But you have to remember that there's something within you that's holier than the holiest angels. You have a soul. And from the fertile grounds of your body can emerge this transformed human because specifically married to your body and your inclinations and your whims and your shortcomings and all your bad character and your biases and maybe some some bad and dangerous thoughts that you have, married to that is the opportunity 
to become incredibly transformatively great. And on a more specific level, the areas of our lives that we struggle with the most are specifically the areas that we have the greatest abilities. If you're still in the game, nothing about your past can stop you. There may be a point in time where people reach a point of no return. Even amongst nations, there's a point once they reach a point of no return, they're done. But as long as you are still in the game, you're still alive, you still have the ability to transform yourself. And it means that the greatness destined for you by the Almighty, because again, if you're a human, the Almighty expects you to become great. And if you're alive, it means you still have a shot at that. Because if you had no shot at that, it means your life is a failure and the Almighty would unplug you, so to speak. You wouldn't be here. If you were here, if you're alive, you could still get there. And those flaws are belying the great and transformative ability that you have. To the degree of a person's impurity is the degree of their latent holy potential. Our sages tell us that we have to love God with both our good inclination and our bad inclination. The verse, of course, in the Shema. With all your hearts, says the Talmud, it means with your good heart and your bad heart, i.e. with your good inclination and your bad inclination. How do you love God with your bad inclination? Isn't your bad inclination the thing that's trying to push you away from God? The Yetzirah is called the foreign God in Jewish literature. Yet we have to love God with our foreign God? This is the idea. We have to use our flaws and warts and shortcomings and checkered past and skeletons in the closet to love God. We have to take our weaknesses and realize that they are disguising our strengths. And in fact, the greatest overachievers are all people that either had or have glaring flaws. Without those flaws, you wouldn't be able to achieve your greatness. And again, we don't have a red cow. And we don't understand how the red cow does what it does. But this phenomenon of extracting purity from impurity is critical for us to achieve our greatness. Okay, let's get to this week's A and Q. Answers and questions. Now, if this is the first time you're listening, you say, well, what does it mean? Answers and questions. Isn't it supposed to be the opposite? Q and A, questions and answers. And the answer is yes. Typically, other people, if you listen to other podcasts, maybe they have Q and A. Here, we do A and Q, which means that me, the presenter, I'm going to ask you a question. You're the audience. And I'm asking you a question, and you have to give me the answers. Um, Q and A is the opposite. You give me a question, and I give you the answer. Here, I give you the question, and you give me the answer. But wait a minute, Rabbi, Wolby, what if I want to give you a question? Well, there's an easy answer for that. If you want to give me a question, there's a perpetual Q&A when you want to ask me a question. Send me an email, rabbiwalby at gmail.com. And just to make this easy, Wolby is spelled W-O-L-B-E, rabbiwalby at gmail.com, and that's how you do Q&A. But on the Parsha Podcast, we do A and Q. I ask you the question, and if you have an answer, you could send me an email to the aforementioned email address, rabbiwobajima.com. Okay, here's this week's question. In our Parsha, we have an attack by snakes. They come and attack the Jewish people. The Jewish people are complaining. The trip that they're taking is, is exasperating for them. And they complain, and they start complaining about the manna again. And the Almighty sends snakes after them. And they run to Moshe, and they, 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 they apologize, and they say, pray for us, and solve this problem. And the Almighty tells Moshe, okay, make a snake, like out of metal, and put it up on a stick, put it up on a post, 
And whoever's bitten, you look up, you see the snake, and you will be healed. And indeed, Moshe makes the staff and makes the snake and puts it up, and whoever's bitten by the snake is healed. And of course, Rashi tells us that it wasn't the snake that was causing them to die, and it wasn't the snake that was causing them to live. When they looked up at the snake, and they looked up to heaven, and they remembered God, and they prayed to God, and that's why they got healed. But here's the question. If we have a problem, there's an epidemic of snakes coming to attack the people. And the people are regretful about what they did. They're repenting. And they might tell Moshe, okay, I want to solve the problem for them. Make a staff with a snake. Put it in the middle of the camp, whoever's bitten. Looks up at the snake, will be healed. Isn't there an easier solution? Why doesn't the Almighty, instead of having this solution of the metal snake, why doesn't he just eliminate the attacker's Eliminate the serpents, eliminate the snakes. Why does the nation's repentance and Moshe's prayer, why does it yield only a remedy, but it doesn't remove the problem completely? That's the question. If you have an answer, send me an email, rabbiwajibba.com. Okay. Last week, we had a question about the katoras, the incense, and why specifically the incense is the antidote to the angel of death and to plagues. And I was blown away by the Parsha podcast family. So many people hit the idea that I wanted to hear from them. And they remembered that the Ketores is a very unique kind of offering. The Ketores, the incense, is a mixture It's a cocktail of 11 different spices and they're mixed together and that creates this wonderful aroma, this wonderful, beautiful, aromatic experience in the temple. But what's really interesting about these spices is that individually, none of them are as beautiful as the collected mix. Moreover, you have... One spice that we're told about, the chelbana, which on its own was awful. It was rancid. It smelled just absolutely terrible. Yet, when it was mixed together with all of them, it actually contributed towards the overall beautiful aroma. So many of the amazing listeners of the Parsha podcast said the idea that when the Jewish people, we're, we're a mix, everyone's different, everyone's unique, everyone has their own qualities and shortcomings and deficiencies. But when we all come together, it creates something really beautiful, and that's enough to stave off the angel of death and to stop the plague. Now, there's an added wrinkle I want to add to this. If you think about it, and this is, of course, pertinent to the pandemic, What exactly is a plague? How does a plague happen? So a plague always starts with patient zero. There's always the first person that gets the virus and then they spread it to other people. So if you think about it, the ktores, the incense, is the exact inverse of the plague. With the ktores, you have one really foul-smelling, really rancid spice. But instead of that, so to speak, overpowering all the other good spices and making the entirety, everyone, so to speak, infected, everyone smelling bad, it's the opposite. The good spices all contribute towards making the bad spice smell good itself. And therefore, it's it's like a perfect remedy for the plague. It's almost as if if you had a patient zero... But everyone, so to speak, helped them and resolved the problem and the patient zero was healed and is not contagious anymore and doesn't spread the disease to anyone else. That's the idea. I think there's some very valuable lessons to that as well. But we'll stop over here. I thank you for listening. 
Have an amazing Shabbos. And please, God, with the help of the Almighty, we will talk again next week.